Today's video is sponsored by Skillshare. Now you guys know Drew makes all these videos and he does a great job, but look at all these props I made. And he, I brought these. I wore my outdoor shirt that I hiked in. It smells like literal forest, dude. Hiked five miles in this shirt on Saturday. Didn't even wash it, because I'm trying to make authentic content for you guys. Wore my big mountain hat. Brought a sleeping pad. Brought my Amiya, my spot meter, my tent lamp, my hydro flask. Got an otter box. I brought all this camping stuff. I got camping stuff everywhere, and Drew wouldn't even let me put it in the video. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another video. This is a video that I've been very excited about making for a long time. It's safe to say that when I got into photography, it was kind of at the height of what I would call the adventure photography era. So I quickly got into going to the mountains and taking photos, fast forward to five years later, and I would still consider myself primarily a landscape photographer. I would say that I became a real photographer probably around 2015. So over the last five years, I've had many victories and even more defeats when it comes to taking landscape photos. So today I'm gonna to be giving you guys five tips that I wish I would have known about landscape photography when I was starting out. The first tip that I would give everybody would be to research your location. It's not a good idea to just show up to a random national park or city and have no idea what to expect and not know what you're looking for. This is kind of a little bit of a secret of mine, but I am actually obsessed with the geotag feature on Instagram. When you go on Instagram, you can search for people, hashtags, or there's a little tab called places. So for example, I live in Knoxville, Tennessee, and my national park that's right in my backyard is called Great Smoky Mountains National Park. So what I would do would be to go on Instagram, go to the places section, and type in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, pick the number one geotag at the top and click on it, and then just scroll through, look for any photos that I find interesting, maybe click on that person's profile. If they're a local photographer, which is sometimes the case, it's all the better because then I can look for a multitude of spots and then sometimes I even end up DMing them and asking them for any insight or any spots that they would recommend. When I go to a new spot for landscapes, I wanna take pictures that are the famous spots that everybody takes photos of because I like to have those personally, but I also wanna try and find stuff that aren't so popular. So the geotag allows me to see the popular spots as well as finding stuff for maybe local photographers or spots that people are working harder to find. The next place that I often research for spots for landscape photographs, you probably guessed it, is Google. Some of the Google searches that I use the most and that I feel yield the best results is simply putting best hikes in X variable national park or city. If I'm going to a city that's not inside the mountains or doesn't have a state park or national park, I'll often just type in best hikes near and then said city. Another place that I love to look is actually on YouTube. YouTube has a really cool community of people that will strap a GoPro to their head or take a small camera and quite literally film an entire hike. A lot of times these videos are pretty long, like 15 or 20 minutes, but if I really wanna see what the entire trail looks like to see if I can really maximize for me as a film shooter shooting multiple roles, sometimes I'll just sit down and watch those entire videos and know, wow, that trail looks really pretty at this spot or this spot, and that really lets me know and get a grasp on the whole trail. So I also would recommend watching some of those trail videos on YouTube. The last place that I would suggest when it comes to researching landscape locations would actually be old photography forums. A lot of times when you type in locations or areas that you're looking to visit, some of the things that will come up in a Google search will be these old forums that sometimes have users that were writing in like 2007. They're quite funny and they're quite ugly, but a lot of times you can find hidden gems in them. This may be my second tip, but it's undoubtedly the most important and it's use the best light. The comment that I get the most is, how did you get those colors? How did you make your photo look like this? 95% of the time, it has nothing to do with my film camera or the film stock I'm using. It has everything to do with the light that I shot in. I know that can be quite a cliche statement and I know it's not the answer that a lot of you guys want to hear, but the truth is, is that the photo is only going to be as good as the light that you're shooting in. So for me, that means one thing, golden hour. For those of you that don't know, we have two golden hours a day, one at sunrise and one at sunset and golden hour refers to the final hour of light that we have in the day or the first hour of light that we have in the day. The first thing I will mention about golden hour is that while it is really nice light for that final hour or the first hour, I'm actually not shooting the majority of my photos during that whole hour. The best segment of light in golden hour is actually usually gonna be the first 10 or 15 minutes of light for sunrise or the last 10 or 15 minutes of sunset. A thing to know is that sunrise times and sunset times are obviously changing with the seasons, so it's good to get in a rhythm of Googling sunrise and sunset times so you can remember as you get into fall and winter, the sun will be going down earlier, which gives you a little bit of wiggle room to make sure that you arrive on time to your spot. 
The third tip I have, and buckle your seatbelt, this one's for all the film nerds, is metering. Most of the tips that I'm talking about in this video will apply to digital photography just as easily as film photography, but this channel is largely based around film photography, and so this metering point will kind of relate more so to that. The first thing I would say in concerns the metering is get a spot meter. In simple man's terms, if you're like me and not very technical, a spot meter simply means I can look through this and point at the exact spot in the landscape that I want a reading for. The next thing that comes into play is your film. I know portrait kind of gets trashed a lot because it's so popular and it's what everybody just tends to use, but there is a good reason why I use it. I know that films like Velvia or Ektar are made for landscape photography, but for me, it's more important that I have something that's forgiving like Portra. Also, one last side note on Portra, if you do like more saturation like an Ektar or a slide film, you can just simply add that in. So it's really hard not to use Portra because it just gives you the best base palette to make the photo whatever you want it to look like, as well as being super forgiving, which is quite necessary in landscape photos. So then the question is, how do you meter for landscape photos? And while there are a multitude of ways, and for me, I've just been doing it so long, I just kind of pick an avenue when I'm in the moment. I'm gonna do my best to explain a couple different ways that I feel like would work for you guys. The first way is by simply metering the sky, the middle of the frame where my subject is, and then metering the shadows and splitting the difference. To keep this as simple as possible, let's pretend that I have a simple shot with a foreground in the shadow, a mountain ridge in the middle, and then a bright blue sky. Let's say hypothetically that my bright blue sky is reading for 1 500th on the specific aperture that I already have set on my camera. The mountain ridge in the middle is reading for 250, and my shadows are reading for 1 25th. When it comes to that, instead of simply just exposing for the shadows like a lot of people suggest, I would probably just go with 250 right in the middle. I know if I just split the difference, whether it's the highlights that are too blown out or the shadows are getting a little bit muddy, I know it's quite likely that I'll be able to save the photo. The next method that I would recommend is one that's quite popular and suggested a lot, which is simply just metering for the shadows. What that means is simply pointing your spot meter at the shadows in the scene or maybe a darker part of the scene and then just shooting it for whatever it's reading there. The reason this method is incredibly popular is because as we all know, you can overexpose film quite a lot and just bring your highlights back down. So when metering for the shadows, I would say, don't be afraid to pull that highlight bar down in post. Another method that I love and also use quite frequently is simply pointing my spot meter directly at the thing that I care the most about in the image and just shooting it at that. So if I have a lake in my foreground, for example, and the sky is even really bright blue and I think, hey, that might be blown out, Sometimes I'll still just point my meter dead center at the peak of the mountain, the part that I care most about in the image and what I want to have the emphasis, see what my reading is and just let it fly. The fourth thing would be the weather. Landscape photography, surprise, is done outdoors, which means that you are constantly at the mercy of mother earth. Now I don't use some fancy app or I don't think you have to buy a fancy app, but I simply use the one on my iPhone. So whatever weather app that you have built on your phone will suffice plenty enough. The reason this is important is because a lot of times in the landscape game, you'll take these really long drives only to realize that the clouds actually were covering the part of the sun that you needed. So getting used to the weather in your area is just something that I would highly recommend. And I've actually become quite obsessed with checking the weather wherever I'm at. The last and final tip before we do some rapid fire tips would be composition. In landscape photography, good composition is the difference between having a non-boring photo and what I would call a boring photo. What I consider a boring photo is something that has nothing going on in the foreground, a very minimal subject, and nothing going on in the sky. For me, the rule is there has to be at least something cool going on in the sky or the top part of my frame, or something interesting going on in the bottom of my frame. For example, if you look at this photo right here, this photo has beautiful light, I love the colors, it even has a blurry bird kind of near the top of the frame, but for me, what really makes this photo is the foreground. You have this unique plant life kind of in the foreground that tells you it's super characteristic of the region, which makes you know, hey, this probably isn't the south or the west coast. It's clearly the southwest. And that makes the photo so unique and really pulls your eye down to the bottom of the frame. This is one of my all time favorite photos, so I reference it a lot. But for me, as pretty as the ridge is and the sky has this nice blue that I really love, if it didn't have the foreground, ultimately it would be a pretty boring photo. Let's look at another example of what I would consider a photo that had the potential to be boring. Here we have a photo of my home national park, the Smokies. Something that's incredibly difficult about the Smokies is that you always have very dark shadows at the bottom of the frame, and that can be incredibly frustrating. 
So this photo is a prime example of something that could have been boring if I wouldn't have been saved by a little bit of green color in these main ridges, as well as these beautiful pink clouds and blue sky up top. If I wouldn't have got lucky that night and I wouldn't have had these fluffy pink and purple clouds or this little ridge with the nice green on it, it would have been what I would call a boring photo because I would have had a decent colored green ridge and then just a lot of dark shadows on the bottom. If I wouldn't have had the purple color and the blue color up top to offset the dark shadows, this photo would have been a no-go for me. So my general rule to not have a boring photo, which is very important to me, is to have something interesting in the foreground or at the top of the frame as well. Because if I just have a plain blue sky and no good color and a standard foreground that doesn't have a person in it or something unique or some color of its own, then no matter what's in the middle of the frame could get pretty bland. I know that was kind of abstract. I wish I could communicate it better, but yeah, try and have something interesting going on in at least one part of your frame. You'll just know when you see it. Now it's come to the part of the video that I'm naming rapid fire tips. I didn't tell Drew about this, but he's gonna put like a game show thing like right here or right here that starts rapid fire tips. I'm also gonna lower my outdoor hat. Here we go, rapid fire tips. Number one, buy a tripod. I know you might think they're for dads only, but they really help out a lot. You can get a starter one at Walmart for about 50 bucks that'll last you just fine. And if you got a little bit more cash, you can get one on BNH for about 150 or less. So tripods. Number two, don't be lazy. Sunrise is always better than sunset. Spots aren't as crowded. It feels more rewarding when you get a good shot. And yeah, sunrise is just better. So wake up. Number three, try middle ground for aperture. A lot of times people get sucked into shooting at 2.8 or shooting at F16. F16 can get kind of boring and depth of field eh, is cool sometimes when it has intent, but I think you should find a middle ground. Try shooting around F8 or F11. I don't know, you might hate it, but I like it. If you can't make sunrise or sunset, my first tip would be look for shadows. Sometimes when you look for the shade or look for interesting thing that the light is covering and or hitting, you can still make some pretty awesome photos around noon. Back to dad style photography. Don't be like 23 year old Corey and think that you're too cool for neutral density filters or polarizing filters. They really help a lot when you're shooting in harsh light. So invest in one. Use leading lines. At the end of the day, we all know they're overdone. We've all seen too many road shots, but who doesn't love a good leading line? Use a wide lens. I know that you can use a longer focal length lens and get great landscape photos. I still do it all the time. But if you're just starting out, it does do a lot of favors to use a wide lens. I would recommend starting at a 24 or a 28. 16 to 35 is a little too wide for me and 35 is a little too tight for landscape. Don't forget to straighten out those horizon lines. Nobody wants to see a photo like this. And to summarize the video, don't beat yourself up. Landscape photography is tough. I still come home over half the time with photos that I wish were better and I feel like I could have metered differently, used a different film, woke up earlier, gone at a better time. But at the end of the day, that's what makes landscape photography so special and so many people like me coming back time and time again to the same spots to get the ultimate photo. I do believe that if you use the tips that I've laid out in this video, that if you're always hunting the best light, you get comfortable metering in a way that you know is gonna give you the look you want, you research your location, you get familiar with the weather. If you do all of this preparation to put you in the right place at the right time, you will get photos that you fall in love with. Today's video is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online platform that offers tons of classes for really anything that you would ever wanna learn. For me, the class that I'm currently going through is actually one that I'm super stoked on. I have long been a fan of a photographer named Andre Wagner. I've looked up to Andre from afar for years on Twitter and Instagram. And so when I saw that he had a class called Street and Documentary Photography, the ongoing moment, I knew that that was gonna be the class that I immediately started watching. In this class, Andre goes over his project and past work, and I did especially love the section where he talks about getting familiar with your camera. Skillshare does the best job of just letting you learn. There are no ads, they're always launching new classes, and it's less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. The best news about the subscription is, the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in my description below will get two months for free of premium membership. So I would really encourage you guys to click that link down below to get those two free months. From creative writing to film and video, graphic design, photography, you name it, Skillshare has a class for you to dive into immediately for free if you click that link. If you have any questions remaining about landscape photography or any specifics that you feel like I didn't really cover, please leave them in a comment down below. My life gets busy just like the rest of us. I don't always have time to respond, but on this video, I'll make a specific effort to go through and answer any question that I see 
regarding landscape photography. So as always, I really appreciate that you guys watched this video. It means the world. Please give it a thumbs up if you did like the video and subscribe if you haven't already. As always, you can follow me somewhere around here on Instagram to figure out what's going on with the channel or see other photos that I'm uploading, usually landscapes. And we'll see you guys again for the next video.